Welcome back, everyone. We're talking about artillery today. Of course, my beloved trade and Russian artillery. If they make them big, badass, and beastly, it is the Russians, especially when it comes to anti-tank guns, of which we are talking about today. Today, we are looking at the 2A19T12 100mm anti-tank gun. It's not often we see anti-tank guns in a modern capability. Of course, anti-tank guided missiles take the hot seat for that today, but this gun is still being used, and even though developed by the Soviet Union many years ago, the battlefields of today are still seeing anti-tank guns being capitalized to try and take out infantry or armored targets of today. So, the T-12 is a Soviet Union representation of very, very high advancement in anti-tank weaponry during the Cold War era. The need for such a weapon arose in the early 1950s as NATO countries were enhancing their armored capabilities, necessitating a more powerful and accurate anti-tank solution for the Soviet military. Development began in 1955, led by the design bureau of the Kirov plant under the supervision of V. Yal Vilkas. The primary goal was to create a gun capable of penetrating the advanced armor of NATO tanks, such as the beautiful American M48 Patton and the British Centurion. By 1961, the T-12 was introduced into service, replacing the older D-48 85mm anti-tank gun. T-12's design featured a long-barreled 100mm gun. This provided a higher muzzle velocity and greater armor penetration capability than many of the counterparts that it replaced. This design enabled it to engage tanks at much longer ranges with much greater accuracy. The gun could fire a variety of ammunition types, including high explosive anti-tank, armored piercing fin stabilized discarding sabre rounds, making it a lot more versatile against different types of targets. During its service, the T-12 was mounted on a two-wheel carriage, allowing it to be towed by a truck or other vehicle and very robust in doing so. The frame was renowned for being very capable of being bounced all over the damn place and continuing to fire with the same level of accuracy, even if it was placed on a road move or off-road. This mobility was very crucial for rapid deployment and repositioning on the battlefield. Additionally, the T-12 could be fitted with an APN-3 or APN-6 night vision sight, enhancing its operational effectiveness during nighttime engagements. It was predominantly very well suited for cold environments as well. The hydraulics in the actual recuperation system were very, very reliable and allowed the gun to fire and maintain itself at all conditions. The T-12 saw extensive use in various conflicts during the Cold War, including various different conflicts with the Vietnam War. It was also involved in the Yom Kippur War, and its ability to neutralize advanced Western tanks earned it a fairly formidable reputation among Soviet and Warsaw Pact forces. At the heart of the platform, the 100mm smoothbore barrel was measuring approximately 63 calibers in length. This extended barrel length contributes to the gun's high muzzle velocity of around 1,000 meters per second, allowing it to penetrate fairly thick armor at significant distances. The barrel is equipped with a single baffle muzzle brake to reduce recoil, enhancing its stability and accuracy during firing. The gun's breech mechanism is semi-automatic, facilitating faster loading and firing rates. This feature is particularly advantageous in combat situations where rapid engagement at multiple targets is necessary or adjustments on the gun. I can personally say firing a field gun or anti-tank gun of any kind at tanks in the move is very, very difficult. You want something that can reload very quickly to re-engage if necessary. And the T-12 could achieve this with a rate of around 10 rounds per minute depending on the proficiency of the crew. The gun platform was a traditional dual-carriage split-trail design, allowing the gun to be stabilized during firing and facilitates a wide range of traverse and elevation adjustments. The carriage also featured a hydromatic recoil system, which absorbs the shock of firing and enhances the gun's overall stability and reliability. There's nothing worse than having a high-caliber gun of this projectile being pushed through the structure and superstructure of an artillery piece like this and causing significant damage to its carriage. For targeting, the T-12 was equipped with the OP-4M-4U optical sight, offering precise aiming capabilities. Of course, the night vision could also be extended into this system, giving it a lot more operational effectiveness during nighttime engagements. However, with the AMP-3 and 6, due to the blast wave and the smoke produced from this gun, it was difficult to do multiple engagements without that smoke and dust clearing, and to see it through a sight in an anti-tank engagement like that is really difficult. I've uh, seen gunners before trying to use tank sights. It's difficult. There's a lot of smoke and dust that gets in the way of obscuring the target. So in an indirect fire roll, the gun could also be used, but certainly not as effective as a standard howitzer because an anti-tank gun isn't really designated or designed to fire in an indirect capability. But what we're seeing in modern day uses of this gun is in an indirect fire. It's literally just shoot and hope for the best because when you use a gun like this, it has the ability to do indirect fire, but it's just not as practical uh, to use. It's just really a waste of time trying to use an anti-tank gun 
in an indirect capability. Of course, uh, the gun did have a lot of versatility in its ability to also uh, be used as defensive platforms. So it was tend to be put into hull down positions, towed in with tracked vehicles, dug in real tight, uh, obscured and covered with camouflage, and then just left there as firing positions in the Cold War conflicts, basically left on a dug in firing position uh, with the gun crew, as much ammunition as the uh, MTLB could carry and then just let it do its thing. It didn't really move too much, even though it had the capability to. Uh, the gun was just too damn big to be lugging around too much. And as you can see, but being pulled around in this mud, uh, you wouldn't want to be doing too many of these moves. If you got these things stuck, it would not be a good time. And the reality of an anti-tank gun is because you do need to set them up and dig them in so tightly, uh, you don't want to be messing around with setting up new positions. You want to structure a good arc of fire, get your crew bumping out the back, uh, ready to go if the uh, tanks come over the hill and just have really good engagement zones and kind of killing zones for these guns. Uh, not that we're used to seeing um, with things like anti-tank missiles where we can shoot and scoot very quickly. We're not going to stay in position. Uh, we'll follow into a wood line, fire the missile and run away. These things were basically just left to their own devices for the wolves to come get. And hopefully the crew were proficient enough to set up this gun, uh, put some rounds onto a target as quickly as they can. And that's really about it. They would tend to not be pulled back out of position so it's a really uh interesting concept when you think of it like that as a crew where you're kind of like well here you go guys you're going to get left in this position and that's you for the day uh, and if you survive you survive if you don't well sucks to suck um, and in the artillery we take our guns very seriously we pride the guns and the colors and you would not abandon your post you would uh, be on that tank site you'd be on that weapon system engaging tanks until all your crew or all your uh, gun members are dead so that's a little terrifying to know that you are a very uh I guess, inexhaustible weapon system that you're just going to be thrown out into a defensive line and in the Russian times, they would just let them try their best, see how they do. Unlike tanks that can maneuver out of the area, these guys were left to as much ammunition as they could and just hold the line, which that's terrifying. I can't imagine being a crew in a gun like that, seeing an armored force come forward. But you got to remember the quantity and the mass of guns that would be in a firing like this. We're seeing in this particular example and scenario, you know, gun crew of maybe six or seven in a battery, um, in a real world Cold War scenario, you're looking at probably close to 60 or 70 of these guns in the firing line, uh, which is truly a devastating amount of firepower. That 100 millimeter gun multiplied by that many times. Yeah, you certainly don't want to be at the receiving end, but when you have a firing position that's locked in place, you lose mobility. So if you can get around the left and right of these guns and that tunnel vision of those sights and the uh, spotters, well, they're doomed, really, aren't they? Now, when we compare the Russian 2A 19T12 to other anti-tank guns of its era, there are several key differences and similarities that emerge that highlight its rather unique position in the landscape of Cold War artillery and self-propelled and anti-tank guns of the time. One of the T-12's primary competitors were the American M40 recoilless rifles. The M40 was a 106mm recoilless rifle widely used by US forces and their allies. And while both weapons were designed to destroy tanks and armored vehicles, they employed very different methods. The M40 utilized, of course, the recoilless rifle mechanism, which allowed for a lighter design and more easily transportable. However, the T-12 smoothbore gun provided a very high muzzle velocity and a lot more greater armor penetration in all honesty in its capabilities, particularly when using fin rounds. And this made the T-12 much more effective against heavily armored targets at longer ranges compared to the M40. Another notable comparison is the British L7 105mm gun, which was mounted on the Centurion and later Chieftain tanks. The L7 was renowned for its accuracy and effectiveness, becoming the standard NATO tank gun of its time. While the T-12 and L7 were both highly effective, the T-12 did have the advantage of being more flexible in deployment because it could be put in a towed configuration in various battlefield conditions. The L7, of course, however, benefited from being highly mobile on those tank platforms, providing a lot more integrated firepower and protection and standardization between the forces that were using them. The German Rheinmetall BK-90 or 90mm anti-tank gun also provided an interesting comparison. Although smaller in caliber, the BK-90 was known for its high rate of fire and ease of use. The T-12's larger 100mm caliber offered superior armor penetration, once again though, making it a lot more effective against modern tanks at the time. Just like the Russians in NATO, the anti-tank missile was really being looked upon and predominantly being focused on in design technology, and anti-tank guns really just weren't on the forefront in necessarily the uh, priority of needing to take out tanks. But they were still there, the T-12 was pulled into action a lot of times, 
But one of the key aspects of the T-12's legacy was its role in shaping modern anti-tank warfare. The gun's introduction really marked a shift towards high-velocity, smooth-bore anti-tank weapons capable of defeating advanced armor but being placed on tanks. This concept has persisted, of course, in modern-day anti-tank weaponry, with the current system still drawing on the principles established by the T-12. Of course, the use of fin rounds, for example, remains a standard in most anti-tank ammunition design. In terms of direct modern applications, the T-12 and its variants continue to see service in several countries. While the newer, more advanced systems have largely supplanted in frontline roles, uh, the T-12 does remain valuable in a reserve and secondary capacity. For instance, as I said, in a defensive line where it's left behind, uh, it's very simple and reliable and very easy to maintain. So it makes it a practical choice for nations with very limited defense budgets or those in need of an anti-tank capability without the expense of modern systems and capitalizing on old Russian ammunition stock. In 1958, Nikita Khrushchev saw the T-12 and was so enthusiastic about a gun, he actually wanted to place it on the T-55. However, the long ammunition would not fit it in existing Soviet medium tank turrets. Therefore, the 115mm U-5TS gun of the T-62 was developed with a larger caliber, so it could use more propellant while not requiring the very long, beautiful T-12 projectiles. Interestingly, in 1971, a new variant was introduced, the T-12 Alpha or the MT-12 Rapira 2A29. This has the same barrel, but a redesigned carriage and gun shield. This allowed the MT-12 to be towed by the MTLB, giving greater mobility. The 2A29R Router, or MT-12R, is an MT-12 version with a radar system. From 1981, the gun could fire laser beam riding guided missiles, or the 9M117 Castet weapon 9K116, and carried the new designator, the 2A29K, or Castet. This was the MT-12K. By the mid-1990s, modern Western tanks' frontal armor protection, though, could no longer be penetrated by the 100mm gun. In terms of ranges and penetration, the fin round with a tungsten tip could penetrate up to 230mm of rolled homogenous armor at 500m, and at 3000m of its maximum range, it could penetrate up to 140mm of rolled homogenous armor at 90 degrees. The heat round, maximum range around 1000m, it was a very slow projectile, penetration of up to 400mm. The HE frag used in a more indirect capability was up to 8,200 meters, basically turning it into a howitzer. And of course, the guided projectile, the 9K117 Castet, could fire up to a range around 5,000 meters with a fairly significant penetration of up to 600 millimeters, uh, which was pretty good for its day. So that's it, folks. That is the beautiful T-12 anti-tank gun. I have to admit, it's really cool to see old school anti-tank guns come into my channel and talk about them because I am an artillery gunner, although I'm not an anti-tank gunner, I do have a lot of love for field artillery and this gun is just a beast. That barrel is absolutely massive, absolute beast at 9.6 meters long uh, or 30 feet. It is a beast and I just love the fact that this thing was designed to basically hold position, hold the line as a quick firing gun and hopefully knock out some tanks along the way. I'd love to hear your opinion on this particular weapon system. Maybe you've even seen it or could even potentially have operated it. I don't know. Do you think the anti-tank gun is still a viable solution of today? Personally, I think it's time for them to obviously be pushed to the sidelines. They're just not capable of what we need them to do nowadays, but it could be very useful, as I mentioned before, for nations that just can't afford more sophisticated anti-tank weaponry. Thanks for watching today. If you did enjoy the video, please leave me a like, all the usual YouTube-isms, like and subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know the score. Thanks so much for joining me and have a wonderful day. All the best.